went away. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. Um, we're really pleased to be having this part two uh, of our sessions on invisible labour with some great guests. Before we jump into it, I uh, wanted to share a little bit of news from Rebus. We're excited to have a couple of new fun things for people to use and play with. Uh, the first of all, the first is that you can now get a dedicated project discussion space if you have a project in the works uh, that allows you to communicate with your team. And we're also uh, opening up to people who want to post calls for contributors in our contributor marketplace. Uh, and if you let us know, we can include those in our reach outs through our newsletter and social media and things like that. So hopefully that's useful to some of you who have work underway. Uh, and I'll get Lee to drop a couple of links and approve her as well, just quick off the mark. Um, into the chat there if that's interesting to anybody and of course you can always uh, reach us through the Rubus discussion space if you want to be asking any more questions about that. So that out of the way, let's get to it. Uh, we had a fantastic call last month. I hope many of you were there and I know I see a few people who've uh, returned for this one with our, our guests talking about invisible labor uh, to get the conversation started, talking about their own stories and experiences of it. And um, we do have that uh, call available if anybody wants to rewatch it. And we're now really pleased to have uh, more guests joining us to tackle this really important issue and coming at it this time through the lens of strategies for addressing and dealing with invisible labour within OER. Um, it's a very big issue. There's a lot that is at the systemic level that is not necessarily something we can address within an hour, but all of us are here to do the work and find practical ways to move forward. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from both our guests and everybody else on this call who has a, has a lot to offer. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Karen from OTN to introduce our guests and a bit more about the session. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, my name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm with the Open Textbook Network, and we are delighted to partner with the Rebus Community Monthly for these office hour calls. As Zoe said, this is a part two, uh, the first time we've tried, I think, a part one and part two. Um, and so in this session, um, continuing the conversation on invisible labor, we're going to talk about strategies to move your initiatives forward in this environment and hear from three people who have three very different roles in the open education space. They're gonna talk about perhaps how they've incorporated OER into their job descriptions, develop techniques for examining and restructuring work relationships to uh, maybe even reduce emotional investment in the work and advocated for sustainable budgets and staffing, especially for growing OER programs. So our three guests today, I will um, share a little bit about them in the order in which they'll talk. If this is your first time in office hours, it's very informal. Our guests will talk about three to five minutes each with some background about their experience and their role, and in this case, how they have approached um, the issue of invisible labor. And then we'll wanna hand things over to all of you and get your questions, uh, your stories, and your comments. So um, now for the introductions. Uh, first, I'm pleased to introduce Tanya Spillaboy. She's the Director of Open Policy at Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies. Tanya leads the Z Initiative there, which focuses on the policy practice and implementation of OER in states, systems, and higher education institutions. After Tanya, we'll hear from Carla Myers. She's Coordinator of Scholarly Communications for the Miami University in Ohio. Her responsibilities include facilitating the use of OER on campus, answering questions about US copyright law, and helping faculty and students promote their scholarship and research within their professional communities and to the public. And then finally, we will hear from Matt DiCarlo. He is Assistant Professor of Social Work in the School of Social Work at Radford University in Virginia. He's also the author of the open textbook, Scientific Inquiry in Social Work. So, Tanya, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you. Good morning. Actually, I guess, I guess it's afternoon for most of you. Um, I'm calling from North Dakota, and I'd like to um, acknowledge the Native tribes that are from this land. And my, um, my husband and children are both from Standing Rock. We have the three affiliated tribes, and w this land is... Um, that I'm sitting on is part of the Great Plains. So it's great to be here with all of you. Um, so my position is with the Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies. 
which uh, there are four regional compacts in the United States. Uh, they are made up of state members. So um, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education has 16 states, including North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Nevada, um, California, and Hawaii. We also have some uh, associated uh, territories that are involved with WICHE. And within WICHE, there are departments. So I'm in the technology department. Um, the, the interesting thing about the compacts in the United States, there's four different regions of states, is that people come together from all these different states to do educational policies. So they're, they're focused on higher ed policy that makes things better for students. Um, a lot of the work that is done at the regional compacts has to do with cost savings, transfer of credit, um, they work on big initiatives for graduation rates and just recently have become more interested in reducing costs through the, through the um, adoption of um, open educational resources. So how would this be done at such a, like, a large grand scale at state and policy level and how do um, legislators, governors, um, state higher education executive officers and the presidents of large universities um, come to understand what policies might help all of you uh, do your work even better on the campuses. So my job is to do a lot of education for um, policymakers, uh, help them understand um, some best practice, uh, give them examples of things that have worked in other states. So you might, um, I worked at the, for example, I worked at the state of Colorado uh, OER council. Uh, they, they, they had a group of people that were appointed by their, their governor to come together and talk about OER and how to do it on their campuses. And so um, I helped them do a survey for the entire state to gather information, um, put together a survey report, to then distribute to their legislature and then the legislature from the recommendations of the OER council and from my uh, consulting um, funded the OER work in the state of Colorado and they're just doing really, really well now. Um, and it's because there are now just on ground advocates and champions at campuses, librarians and technologists, uh, faculty who are doing the real hard work um, and so from my perspective at this, at this very high level, um, one of my jobs is to A, help policymakers that are interested in funding and promoting student-centered uh, open work, help them to do it in a way that supports what you all do on campuses, uh, to do it in a way that is sustainable over time, and to help them understand the invisible labor that goes on at campuses. So one of the big um, questions, and I got this today actually from a legislator at a meeting, um, uh, now that we're doing all this OER at a campus, um, we're seeing that our bookstore is getting less traffic. So now we've got you know this extra um, expense over here and so, uh, my job is to help them through some of those questions and um, really help guide the discussion to something that focuses on students and ways that um, that we can all make this work across. Because you know, legislators and policymakers and presidents they all they all want to do what's right for students. I. I think there's this, um, I, I, when I meet with them, I just see this really genuine care and uh, love for trying to do something great for the world and especially help campuses and education. So, um, you know, giving them the, the education they need to do open and to really support the work on your campuses. Um, help them understand the invisible labor that you all do and and also it's good for you all to understand um, 
what happens behind the scenes at that high level, state policy level. Thank you, Tanya. And now we'll hand things over to Carla. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so when I was presented with this topic idea, I think one of the things that really struck me is invisible labor in the library in general. You know, thinking about when patrons encounter a book or film in the library and they think, oh, it's just there, not realizing the selection decision or the acquisition or the cataloging. And the way the invisible labor that we all do, we can kind of use that to kick off a conversation about invisible labor tied to OER. So a little bit about what I do. Um, my job title is Coordinator of Scholarly Communications for the Miami University Libraries, and that's Miami in Ohio, not sunny Florida. Um, it's part of my job is being a copyright librarian, but a significant part of my job, probably 50% of my time, is helping support our OER and affordable learning initiatives here at Miami University. I love doing this. Um, I am part of a campus-wide committee that I co-chair with another librarian and our associate provost on campus that kind of leads up these initiatives for the whole entire campus. We have three grant programs tied to OER and we have two what we call affordable learning grants. It focuses more on the affordability piece than maybe necessarily the creation of use or use of um, truly open educational resources. So even though I am one of three co-chairs on this group, um, by nature of my job responsibilities, I'm doing a lot of the frontline things like um, hosting what we call our OER Explore grant program, which is kind of like the OTN's introduction to open education model where they come in, we talk a little bit about affordable education, we do some hands-on work with some actual OER. Um, we have our OER Adopt program, which is exactly what it sounds, grant provided for faculty who want to adopt an OER. And we are launching our OER Create program to help support faculty who want to create and write their own OER. I couldn't be any more excited about this. So while I love doing all of these, there's all this invisible labor tied to it. Um, so with the OER Explore, it's preparing the call for applications because we have people apply for this program because there is the grant funds tied to that. It's reviewing these applications. It's printing off an OER in their subject area. And um, I say this with love in my heart, chasing faculty down afterwards to make sure they are posting their review in a timely manner. Most are very good about it, but sometimes it's a little bit like herding cats. Um, with OER Adopt, I help review the grant applications before they even come in. I have meetings with faculty to help them identify an OER. I'm part of the group that then reviews these applications. But then even today, a good part of my day was unexpectedly spent on working with a couple of faculty who com completed their grant requirements now that we're at the end of the semester. Our semester just ended last week. So it's that mentality that you come into work and you're like, oh, I'm going to get these things done today. But instead, you end up popping over and doing these things, and that's the way things happen. Um, but the invisible labor about now, when do I find time to do the things that I'm doing? Or I think one of the best examples I can think of um, with invisible labor is tied to our OER Create program. So Miami University is beyond excited to be one of the founding members of the OTN Publishing Co-op. And we had a great time going through the training last year. Um, and initially we thought with OER Create, not only would I be the project manager for these projects, but I would do a lot of the things in the background to actually help facilitate the publication of these. Um, because I do have a little, little bit of publishing experience um, as a journal editor. And it was really interesting because it's, it's, we got about three quarters of the way through this training. And I remember after the training session, I went to my boss's office and I said, we're in trouble. Um, and it has nothing to do with the OEM, o, um, OTN Publishing Co-op Program, which is phenomenal. Where we were in trouble is me realizing there is no way I can do all this publishing work on my own as a one woman shop unless I stop doing all the other things I'm doing and do nothing but this. And I said, you know, I need you, my bosses, to make a decision. Do you want me to become the OER publishing librarian for two or three years, which I will gladly do and be in my office literally constantly doing all the work to publish these? Or do you want me to continue what I'm doing, which is to be out on the front lines and engaging with our faculty and getting people involved with these? 
And in the end, Miami University said, you know what, we're probably going to end up having Scribe help do a lot of this work so that instead of you being invisible in your office, um, that you are out on the front lines continuing to engage with people. And you know, I would be invisible in that role because I would be in my office, um, even though it's a very nice office, but losing that engagement. But I think it was that moment. Um, my recommendations for the people here is communicate, communicate, communicate. You can never over communicate. And um, it's one thing I've learned not only as a librarian, but I was a department head in my previous job. And I would always tell my staff, if you're in a rocky place, if things are going on, talk to me. It's my responsibility to do whatever I can to help you out. But I can only help you out if I know what's going on. Um, and I think that's why I learned very early on whether it's the OER Explore and oh my gosh, do we just have a student employee who can run over to the copy center and get these bound copies of these OER from me because I just don't have 15 minutes to do that today. Or the very frank discussion we had about OER Create saying I could do this if you want me to give up all these other responsibilities. Um, is just saying here is what I am doing. Here are the initiatives I'm involved with making it very clear. Here's how much time is involved with this. Just a consultation to go talk with faculty. That can be an hour out of my time going over to their office, coming back, sending up follow email, follow up emails. There's a few more hours maybe looking around for open educational resources that they can um, use in their class. So just very clearly communicating to your supervisors, here's the different ways that I am engaging with these and realistically, here's how much of my time that it takes. Um, and then two, if you want me saying to your boss, if you want me to be doing more, what am I going to give up in order to be able to do more? Or how can we deprioritize some other things? Um, and I think too, saying that I'm willing to be a partner, of the, um, I'm willing to be a partner. I'm willing to be part of this. I'm willing to give it everything I have. But here is what I need from you as my boss. And that can be just moral support. That great job, you're doing well every now and then. Um, that can be shifting around priorities in your job on what you're gonna focus on, maybe giving away some of your responsibilities to somebody else. It can also be a financial investment, and I don't necessarily mean more money because, you know, we would all love more money, um, but I think it can be going to your boss and saying, there are things that I can engage with, and this may cost money to send me to a conference or to allow me to participate in this training, but here's the value that we're going to get out of this, and if you want me to be able to fully support this, um, I would appreciate getting the support from you, and I've been very fortunate here at Miami University, here at Miami University, my fabulous dean here in the library, the times that I've gone to him and said, you know, I would like to travel and be part of this, and here's the value I will get out of it, and here's how it will help me do my job better. He has been very supportive of financially helping find some resources for me to get there for many of these. Um, so I think my recommendations are just communicate to your colleagues what you're doing, to your boss what you're doing, and then having that conversation together about how you are going to prioritize especially that invisible labor that people see the end results but they don't see the time that you put in maybe on your own um, and then asking for what you need whether it's that reprioritization of your time or more support from your colleagues or maybe I need some money so I can go participate in this training so I have more knowledge to do this better thanks Carla and Matt we're going to turn things over to you We can see your screen, but we can't hear you yet. On mute. There we go. Hi. There sorry. You are. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hey, I have slides. I don't know why I like slides. Uh, so, um, so I, as my intro mentioned, I'm an OER author. Um, so I think uh, a good question to ask is like, are authors visible and to who? Um, so some of the things that I learned is that for students in my class where my book was used, I am visible to those students, but I am not really visible to even students at my own university who I am not teaching who also use this textbook. So if I write a textbook, other people in my department, my colleagues will usually take notice uh, if they're not particularly enamored with the other alternative, the traditional alternatives, uh, they might use it. 
Um, and to students in their classroom, I'm just another sort of author. So it's, it doesn't really so much matter to them. Um, I found that within my department, I am pretty visible as somebody who does this stuff, as the person who might be bringing up OER at a faculty meeting, or if we're doing, uh, as we're doing in our undergraduate program, we're doing some uh, course redesign and uh, curriculum redevelopment, I'm the person sort of talking about uh, OER and textbook costs and all that stuff inside of that room. Um, so it is sort of visible to them, and I've gotten a lot of good uh, collaborations and partnerships out of that stuff. Um, where it is a little bit more questionable is whether it is visible for promotion. Um, as I understand it, uh, OER and tenure and promotion is sort of a thing that's talked about a lot, but I don't know that there have been a lot of things that, a lot of good examples for what to do, although I'm, I, I'm still looking for those. Um, so I could, be, I could be wrong on that. Um, I think uh, for myself, I think if my open textbook were to count towards tenure and promotion, because it would mostly be because people have no idea what an open textbook is. That if they learned that, like, if that, no, I copied and pasted like half of that book, and like a lot of it is not original scholarship, they might actually be a little bit more unclear than just like, oh, okay, you published a something with somebody. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, grants help. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I stole from, the, from a Rebus community textbook was to track adoptions. Um, and uh, having a survey, even at the beginning of the textbook on the landing page, uh, I don't really know whether those people, I haven't really followed up with those people, but I do get at least like within the first, like the first semester, this is how much people have saved, this is how many students have used it, which has been really, really helpful in just sort of putting this forward as a project people might be able to understand. Uh, and I think my first sort of strategy towards making this stuff visible was to engage in OER research. So, um, Basically, uh, publications for me, I have very little publication requirement. Uh, I am at a teaching focused school uh, that likes to do some research, but I'm pretty far from an R1. Um, so uh, st studying uh, teaching, studying pedag pedagogy was sort of a natural fit. Uh, I have uh, ample access to that population uh, and there are tons of great resources out there. Um, and I think within uh, just my own school, the scholarship of teaching is something that is sort of included in our teaching requirements. That's not actually student evaluations of teaching, which are not a particularly useful measure of anything. Uh, so uh, the process of engaging in OER research to the extent those things are experimental can actually give you other data that can sort of talk about things that maybe uh, student evaluations of teaching miss. So you can not only point to like, I got a 4.2 out of five, but also like students talked about how much it meant to me like that they did, you know, X, Y, or Z. I think that's pretty helpful. Um, so where I ran into a little bit of a <laughs> challenge was like, all right, so um, I, I became an OTN uh, campus leader. And so I was doing some training work and some advocacy work on the campus. Uh, and I was also doing some trainings at schools of social work across the uh, state of Virginia. I got a small grant to do some of that stuff. And literally I had a roadshow presentation where I came and like, set up the stuff and talked about Talk with uh, OER about uh, talked about OER with uh, social work professors, uh, but I'm not a librarian, and OER is not part of my job description at all. Uh, and so I think I sort of conceived of campus leaders like it'll probably fit somewhere under service. I'm probably uh, not necessarily the best person to talk about tenure and promotion requirements because I'm even though I've read them, I'm still not 100% sure of where anything fits, and I don't really get uh, a lot of uh, they didn't really set me up with like a mentor or somebody who's gonna guide me through that process. So I'm just sort of feeling it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot less visible of a service position than you might ordinarily think. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, I, this is something that other presenters have sort of echoed, especially Carla, that like having an open-minded administration was fantastic. Like the chair of my department was very open to this and very open to the fact that I did a, once I heard about OER, I started a 180 from what they hired me to do research on, it's fine. Uh, and, uh, and also a dean who was willing to, uh, you know, put me out on loan to essentially the provost. So uh, in Virginia, uh, they passed a bill, not this past legislative session, but last, the one before that, that uh, public universities have to have some kind of OER policy. And that's it. That was the whole, that's the end of the bill. So in some campuses, it is one line saying, OER is awesome. That's paraphrasing. In other campuses, it like there was a, uh, there was uh, some guiding documents put out by uh, Chef, which is uh, the Southern version of uh, 
Mitchie uh, <laughs> that we heard about earlier. Um, and so they uh, put out some uh, sample documents. Anyway, so uh, our provost basically took that and created this OER committee. Um, she sort of took people from each college. Obviously, I volunteer for my college. My college was more than happy to have somebody do that. Uh, and what ended up coming out was uh, a an idea that we needed to be the people who are implementing OER course labeling, who are creating faculty-based trainings in concert with our faculty development people, and then just doing the sort of nitty gritty invisible work of like doing one-on-one -on -one help. So if somebody wants to adopt OER, but they don't want to buy into the sort of adaptive courseware for an OpenStax textbook, like who's gonna help them create stuff? Like I'm not an instructional designer, but I can sort of talk about the permissions and responsibilities who you might wanna to talk to. Um, we're a pretty lean university, so we do have instructional designers, but nobody who's really working in open. Uh, and then also just raising their profile afterwards as well. So to try and make their work more visible to campus. Uh, so if you have people who are adopting OER, creating OER, um, or who are working on textbook affordability, even if they're not doing open itself, raising their profile and trying to tell their stories as well is really great. Um, so advice I was given, which I am very glad I did, is to get a course release <laughs> uh, for this stuff. So as the chair of the OER committee, um, I get some time off each semester to actually do some of that stuff. And uh, also I think like Carla said, um, I ended up dropping my responsibilities or uh, transitioning out of the role where I was a coordinator for our online master's program. Uh, and that just, it, it seemed that it was gonna be way too much stuff. Um, the cool stuff is you get some new OER friends, you get other people who you had no idea were working on this stuff, um, who are actually working on this stuff. This is my first year as a campus leader, so everything's sort of new. Um, and uh, yeah, just taking advantage of policy changes, making your work visible to upper administration. OER is on their radar. Our provost would sort of forward me stuff from like publications that provosts read, which I didn't really realize were a thing until now. Um, but like this is now on their radar and sort of talking about it in terms of the issues that we're facing, like retention or changing student body, cost savings to students uh, is great. And I also see a lot of sort of value in making this invisible work open to other people by sort of sharing the stuff that OER committee members, OER advocates, OER trainers do more broadly. Um, I think we're gonna sort of open up an, uh, an OSF.io page and sort of open up as much as we can for the stuff that we're doing, uh, just so that other people don't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel again. So yeah. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to our three guests, Tanya, Carla, and Matt, for introducing um, some different strategies they've used uh, around the issue of invisible labor in OER. Um, as Matt was talking, a couple of questions came in on the chat, and so this is open to anybody uh, in the call who would like to chime in. So Amy Hoffer uh, is multitasking, it sounds like, from a bus, and uh, her question is, um, around the term invisible labor and whether it refers to labor that's invisible because it's gendered. And if folks are thinking about this issue along the lines of feminist analysis by using the term in this context. So um, uh, Sybil, uh, who has the following question, said that she's definitely thinking um, that this is gendered from her experience on her campus. I think there's probably many in this call who would agree that often it's um, marginalized people who are doing uh, invisible work and uh, volunteering for it or having it kind of show up on their desk. Is there anyone else who would like to um, address Amy's question or explore it? I can jump in a little briefly. I think, Amy, we did talk about this a little more in, in part one and it was raised a couple of the things like, um, I think this might have been Ellie who was talking about this kind of enthusiasm that you have to show when you're you're constantly working with people and that that's often in, uh, that emotional labor is, is expected more of women in the workplace generally and so it, it's that same pattern is replicated within OER in a big way um, and then as Karen mentioned that it, it's often people who see the the who are on the front lines of seeing the value of for students um, who really put the care 
uh, into the work that they do that does generally, um, it, it, it is that is gendered and it's also more common in, uh, in all sorts of marginalised communities. Um, I, I, as I say, I'd refer back to that one for, there was some interesting discussion of those um, that would would love to kind of keep, keep going as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll pause there and see if any of the guests want to, of, on this uh, want to jump in a little. Zoe, this is Sarah Cohen. I'm sorry I'm not record. I'm not videoing, but I did just want to say, I think that that's such an interesting question for some research in, in the OER space. And I'm going to take a second to highlight um, the OER Fellows Program um, that John Hilton runs out of the Open Education Group. I think that that would be a really interesting topic um, for deeper exploration in, in OER. So if someone, Amy, wants to take that up, um, I would really be interested in, in learning more about that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It feels like the kind of thing I've heard and been a part of conversations about, um, but there'd be real value in, in taking that approach to it and, uh, and surfacing more of it, because that's exactly what we're talking about here. There are so many different parts of what is happening in the OER community, both the, the active work that we're doing on campus, but also the expectations of the people involved that is, is all, uh, could all do with more, uh, more research and analysis and understanding um, so that we know what's happening to the people involved in this work is, uh, as, as we move forward and as we kind of building this system together. Okay, um, Sybil also had a, a broad question about um, basically getting open education started in her state. <clears throat> so Tanya, maybe you have some uh, recommendations as Sybil is in North Dakota. So she asked, how can I, a lowly faculty member who already uses lots of emotional labor to rally the troops on my own campus, get something started in North Dakota like Oregon has, Open Oregon, without putting another gorilla of invisible labor on my shoulders? Okay, so um, first of all, if, you, if I know what institution you're at, I can connect you with a whole bunch of people. Um, and if you're in North Dakota, uh, there's already been a lot done. Um, when I first started as an OER person, I was at the North Dakota University System Office, which is the governing body uh, for all of the institutions in the state and it intersects with the legislature. And I contacted the Open Textbook Network and a lot of the things that I've um, come to now are because of the great connections that I made um, with all of you, with Spark, with um, others in the OER community. Uh, I was a OER fellow with um, John Hilton as, um, as she mentioned, as Sarah mentioned. And so um, I just would say, don't do this all on your own. So I, I feel the question itself was just very heavy and like you got so much um, responsibility or like this is this huge lift when actually there are literally thousands of us out there who have already lifted. And if we all do it together, it's so much easier to, um, to, to accomplish something. Um, in the state of North Dakota, we've got the first uh, audited OER initiative report from any state in the United States. And uh, North Dakota saved anywhere between, I mean, his, his estimates were very low um, compared to, to institution estimates, but um, institutions are estimating between $10 million and up, and others are, you know, his, um, direct count of every OER penny was somewhere around the $2 million mark. Um, and he said that was a very conservative estimate. So there's just a lot already happening. And um, I'd be happy to help you connect with other advocates in your region. But for anybody who's on the call that feels like this is their responsibility or that they have to do this all on their own, or I think that's just, um, I don't want to say that's a gendered thing in itself, but perhaps, you know, like that you feel like you have to do all the things, right? And you don't have to do all the things. Um, there are a lot of people who can help you. And as women, maybe if we're talking in a gendered term that kind of connects to the last question is that it's okay to ask for help, let some of it go, 
not think you have to do everything. You can just do like one small tiny thing and it still helps the big lift. So um, if that gives you some background. Thanks, Tanya. And thanks for mentioning the Open Textbook Network. Sarah also mentioned uh, that North Dakota is a member. And listening to you just reminded me, you know, that's why we're all here together in this office hours call. That's why we're partnered with the Rebus community, because we're all in this space. We definitely want to be here for one another and support one another. Um, so if you are feeling like, how am I going to do this all by myself? Hopefully what you're hearing is you don't have to, people have walked this road before, they can share resources and tips and um, you can come to these calls and uh, find a network of people who want to support your work. Can I add something on to that? Sure. Um, just to say that I'm going to go a little offbeat, but let me finish this thought here. You can do some of this all on yourself, but it's little tiny itty bitty baby things. It's just talking about it, getting people interested, clearing up some of the common misconceptions related to OER. But I think use that to put out your feelers to find out who can partner with you, not just going to conferences or engaging in opportunities like these about, oh, these people weren't that interested too. Can I reach out to them to see what they're doing? Can I get some ideas? Can I borrow things from them? But especially your faculty too. Um, I think sometimes it's one thing for us to say with our institution of the library that this is important, that you know we need to be doing more to support this. But then when it comes from people outside the library, when faculty are coming back to the dean or director of the library saying, hey, I had this great conversation with so-and-so about this. What more can the library do to support this? Um, it can help emphasize to those people who can help you then prioritize more time in your job to do this. Um, so there are little tiny itty bitty baby things you can do on your own. Um, but just from somebody who tries to do everything on their own because they feel like they should. Um, and going back to emotional labor, you will burn yourself out so quick and it's open. The whole idea of this is sharing. And to date, I have not met one single librarian who I've reached out to who's been like, no, I'm not going to partner with you. Go away. Instead, they're more like another ally. Fantastic. What can we do to address this together? Or um, steal from a copyright librarian. Steal. Don't infringe on copyright. But um, reach out to other institutions and say, we did this with Texas A&M. Hey, you guys did this great student recognition award. Could I possibly steal all the information you have, including your application form for that award? And they were like, absolutely, here you go. And we made it our own here, but um, those connections are so valuable. So definitely be on the lookout. It's, I would be shocked if you would not find people in your state who would be willing to partner with you. Yeah, uh, just, to, just to sort of throw into that. Uh, yeah, I think once you start doing uh, things in OER, like it, it'll just, the recognition and, and stuff sort of comes. So if you put out, even if it's something uh, relatively small, uh, just that sort of forward momentum, if there's really truly nobody else on your campus who is there to do that work, uh, by sort of doing that work, you can be that person and that can be as small or as big as you, as you need it to. Uh, and I think making friends with uh, librarians, uh, people who are more familiar with the OER uh, picture more broadly within your state. I know that's really been helpful for me um, because those people really showed me like, okay, no, this is, the, yeah, this is a larger sort of thing. Uh, I also think if you are not a librarian, um, that you, making your things sort of visible to your profession can be a thing. Uh, and because first, I, I know it may seem strange to people here, but like textbook costs, copyright, not usually a thing that's talked about, like by, it may not be a sort of problematized thing within your profession. So if you're proposing OER as a solution, it may just be a solution of what? Like what, it, everything works not great, but like it's good. Uh, so I think that can be, that's also a sort of way to do that. Matt, I think this next question uh, is in response to something you mentioned in your presentation. So both Wilhelmina and Trisha are very interested in knowing what provosts read. Um, and, so, <laughs> and if anyone else has, I'm gonna look at that one. Yeah, I hang on. Let me let me pull that up. Uh, I will pull up all of my. Not I'm not sharing them with you, uh, but. <laughs> Uh, so they read press releases from publishers. So uh, they read stuff from the bookstore. 
Um, uh, they read, I don't know where she found this, but uh, our legislature passed uh, an initiative to label no and low cost textbooks. So I'm not really sure where she read that. Um, inside higher ed um, was a good one. And uh, universitybusiness.com. What was that last one? Universitybusiness.com. Hmm. Not a place that I had heard of before, but yeah. Thanks. Does anyone else have any thoughts on how to essentially get their provost attention or get this issue in front of them? I do. <laughs> this is, uh, I think that pro provosts are interested in best practice in other institutions and they also tend to look to institutions. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. They tend to look to institutions that they aspire to be like. And so um, if you're at a regional four year institution with a, you know, student base of around 2000 students, you might be, that provost might be aspiring to be more like the R1 with 10,000 students or um, like a neighboring school or some, uh, you know, they have sort of a, a network of peer institutions. And so if um, you're interested in inciting the interest of your provost around OER, send them information about the awesome work that's happening at a peer institution or another institution um, neighboring that they they kind of look up to um, even community college uh, provosts are interested in what community colleges are doing in other states and so i think that giving them examples of what can be done what is being done um, and showing how much attention and positive um, reinforcement that gets for the institution is is really enticing for a leader. I think that goes back to what Carla was saying as well of looking at other people who have been successful in this work and borrowing from them or stealing from them with permission uh, to whether it is it's the conversations that they've had with their provosts in order to, uh, to make the case for OER and things like that. I think that's a really great way that you can draw from what other people have done already as well. I just would say also, like when you're talking to an administrator, um, administrators have certain things that they need to accomplish. So starting with like open pedagogy or starting with something that's really dense and difficult is not the place to start. You start with something like, hey, if we can reduce the cost of attendance for all of our students, um, this is a great sell to your boss who makes you know the president look great and it's something you could put on a billboard outside of town to attract more students and these are the things that resonate with provosts so um you know starting with something super dense is they're not that just doesn't you know and really academics a lot of they just they just need the provost speak i don't know how to explain you're, you're talking to a different audience right and um, Michelle noted in the chat as well that they also listen to student government and so that outreach can pay off in that way. Um, okay, the next question is about incorporating OER into a job description and if anyone has advice on how to proceed. I'll put you in there. Um, I think it depends. So in my previous job, I was also a coordinator of scholarly communications, which we know is an umbrella term for a lot of things. There, I was mainly the copyright librarian, but I was doing little bits of OER work here and there um, as I was able. So for me there, it was including it in my annual report, making it very clear to my boss that I'm doing this and that there's more of the interest in this on campus and we've had these conversations about it and do we want to prioritize this within the scopes of the scope of the job that I'm doing um, by formalizing it as part of my job description. 
Now that said, I know job descriptions can be hard to rewrite. When they are actually easiest to rewrite is when there is nobody in that position. So when I left that position in Colorado, one of my recommendations to my boss as I was leaving is if you do rewrite this position, I would encourage you to include OER or affordable learning in there so that this person is kind of empowered to prioritize more with that. Um, in my current job, it is written to my job description, but I think maybe it's one or two sentences out of a page and a half long job description. Um, but it's, it's recognizing that um, there's many different things in my job description, but having that constant conversation with my boss about which things are we prioritizing every year, um, or having that conversation with my supervisors that, you know, I am more than happy to become the OER publishing librarian for three years, but if you're going to have me do that, we need to communicate this to the campus because I'm not going to be able to offer all of these other services that I'm doing. So whether it's formal or informal, again, having that conversation with your supervisors about the work that you're doing, but then also making sure that you're communicating that out as you are taking on these new responsibilities, not only so that people understand how you can better help them if they're interested in these things, but then maybe if you're backing off in some other places, letting people know I may still be able to help you, but not as much as before, or I'm so delighted you're interested in that. I have a colleague who's taken over those responsibilities. Let me connect you with them. Thanks, Carla. Um, I have a question about sort of uh, quantifying the amount of work done. So Matt mentioned, you know, tracking adoptions helps. You mentioned in talking with your supervisor about trying to um, sort of sum up all of the work that you're doing and the trade-offs that you'd have to make if you're continuing to do that work. Do you think it's an effective strategy to track your hours for a time in you know, particular OER focused work? Yes and no. Um, and I might actually say, and maybe this is a touchy subject, although I think it ties in, I track my hours I spend outside of work working on this stuff. Um, so for example, I'm going to go home tonight and work on an OER affordable learning thing because it needs to get done by the end of this week and um, tonight is the only time I'm going to be able to do it. Um, there was a time about a year ago where for two weeks, because we had something happen last minute, not only was I spending almost every hour on the job, but every hour in the evening and every hour over the weekend working on OER stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's some of that is on me for working those outside hours for choosing to do that. Some of it is wanting to get it done, um, realizing that maybe I didn't have to do it in that way, but that I had my own motivations for helping support this person in the project. Um, some of it is it's kind of the way my job functions and being salaried, you realize there's some hours you work 40 hours a week, there's some hours you work 50. Um, but that was one of the more persuasive conversations I had with my supervisors is saying that I'm giving up my nights and weekends to work on these things and while I'm happy to go to bat from time to time this is not sustainable for me to give up these extra hours of my life continually to be able to do this so we need to either look at different ways of me doing this um, some ways to maybe get me some help like with student employees helping with these things or again the rearrangement the reprioritization of the things that I'm doing in my job so now maybe I'm 75% affordable learning OER librarian and only 25% copyright librarian instead of both um, so I would say the most persuasive arguments I sometimes make or are is that invisible labor that we're doing at home, those hours I'm spending outside of my office doing this work? I wonder if those are, are Oh, those are great suggestions. I would also add, if, if folks on the call are interested in writing job descriptions, um, I think, you know, we've had some recent um, uh, new programs that have come up to help do training for open educational resources, advocates, librarians. Um, I teach with the Spark Open Education Leadership Program. The Open Textbook Network has a training um, for librarianship uh, in open. And we also have a, a Creative Commons certificate that has come up. And I would just caution folks who are writing job descriptions not to make those certificates or um, job descriptions, you know, those particular programs um, 
as a baseline, but maybe saying in there that you've, you've expanded into or you've shown proficiency of open educational resources so that as this, um, as this field evolves, right, as a discipline, as an academic uh, pursuit, that we're all free to sort of continue creating it. I, I feel like um, overall, you know, we're, we're trying things to do more education, to, sh to prove competency, to show that we're leaders in the area while we're still learning it, right? So um, I, I would just, you know, I heard her talking about working these additional hours and um, that shouldn't that shouldn't be an expectation of the of a job description that someone would have to do a, dish, a, a whole lot of additional work to either become competent or to um, you know to to do the job functions that they were hired to do. So I'm just kind of you know I want everyone to get the training they need, and I love that I love seeing OER librarian ads. I'm also cautious about what does that entail and what were they required to do prior to learning and, and can they continue to learn on the job? You know, there's, it's just a lot of um, considerations for the actual humans doing the work. Mm -hmm. Tanya, um, this is Sarah. I, I couldn't agree more and I'm so glad you said that. I was actually gonna um, pop in and say, um, kind of, I think, connecting back to the, the theme of invisible labor, and I, I wanted to take a minute to just say that I, I have a concern in general of us, um, those of us that are, that are passionate about this work, that are often the advocates and the champions for this work, and to go back to, I think, Sybil's point earlier in the call around, you know, feeling like we're the ones that have to carry this forward on our own at our institutions, but I really want to stress that I think um, it's, I, I hate, I, and Carla, please forgive me. I don't mean to call you out here, but I hate to hear about people that are doing 40 hours at work and then another 20 or 30 hours on their own time when they go home. Um, I, I just want to remind people, like we, we are people <laughs> and we are allowed to put our work down and we are allowed to nourish ourselves and take care of ourselves in order to have the the wherewithal to continue on to do this work i'm not saying don't don't work from home or whatever i'm just saying i think that the expectation that we need to continue to push on all fronts at all times even in those times when we are outside of work i just think that's something else that contributes to this concept of invisible labor and and warrants careful consideration about you know burnout and about what are our goals as a movement and as educators in what are we conveying when we do that work? Um, I, I just think that's important. I think sort of there's this impatience that we all have to have all the answers and do it all right now and it needs to be all done. I mean, there's this giant race toward like, oh, we need this entire program to be zero textbook costs like tomorrow. Yeah. And we really don't. You can make it amazing. I mean, those are all wonderful unicorn goals in the sky, right? That are so wonderful when you see them. However, um, small changes are still really, really useful for our students. Absolutely. One, one book, one resource, one moment when you can talk to someone who's never heard of open before, those are all wins toward the big goal. And also just to say, I think this goes to the idea of the long game. Yep. You know, we're, we're in this for a long game. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think that, you know, we have to, we as people that are doing this work in, in trying to not only think about our programs, but very much to the point about job descriptions, you know, thinking about how do we institutionalize this work and make it part of the work of our institutions instead of just work that I'm doing at home. Um, these are these are the tactics of a, of a of a bigger strategy, you know, and how are we going to take this over time and we have to be able to go over time. And that's why I, I get so worried um, around us all working so much on this beyond what we already do. 
um, because I think we do need to consider how we're going to keep going. And I think I just want to also say bravo for having a call, having calls like this that allow people to voice these questions and concerns. This is part of that nourishment. So thank you to Karen and to Aperva and to Zoe for, for hosting these calls, because I think it's so important that this allows people to talk about these issues in a way that does support that, that struggle and that challenge. Thank so, you. So, I'm, really I'm wondering if there's a way that we can, this is kind of a little off the topic, but perhaps would alleviate some of this pressure. And, um, you know, you talked about emotional labor and this, um, you know, the heaviness of doing such giant things, but I would love to see a celebration of small wins, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? These, these moments when one faculty member who just wouldn't, couldn't even come to the session showed up, right? That's a moment when we can celebrate something together, small wins uh, toward open. I love, somebody hashtagged it already, which is awesome. Yeah. But can we, <laughs> can we celebrate these things so that we don't all feel so responsible to make the whole world open, which is what we all want, right? But, um, I think, you know, Lee's uh, hashtag small wins in the chat is actually one great way to do that because there's also been a conversation in the chat about the power of social media, that provosts are reading Twitter, that this is one way that we can connect and find each other. So I, hey, let's give it a go, small wins, uh, and see what we all come up with. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's a great idea, especially if you are working um, remotely, or if you do feel isolated, you're maybe one of the few people on your campus doing this work, just being able to sort of tell someone, hey, I've accomplished something, um, whatever, wherever it falls on the spectrum of um, scale and size. Um, so this has been another great Zoe. I'd like to jump in just with one point, sorry, I've been <laughs> trying to get in there just to, to add to what Sarah said, which I think is, is really important. Thank you for chiming in with that. And as we're thinking about how you do OER work, if we don't figure out how to do it without there being those extra 20 or 30 hours built in, we're also excluding people from being able to do the work. That there are yeah. people with responsibilities outside of their 40 hours that mean that they cannot commit. It goes back to Amy's mention earlier about it being gendered, uh, that you know that women's the expectations on many women for childcare, for family care, for housework, all of that means that they don't often, many of them don't have the time to do all this extra. So we all of us have to work out how to make this sustainable and a, vi a viable option for everybody to be able to get involved in OER, not just people who have the capacity to do that extra work. That's just a point I wanted to make. Um, and I think, to, again, to refer back to our previous session, Monica spoke about this really well um, and, and some of the others too. So. Okay, thank you. I just need to get that in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good summary. I mean, we're about out of time. Um, we're at the top of the hour. It's been another lively conversation. Um, so thank all of you for your questions in the chat and uh, that you've asked in person and the conversation that ensued. Please join me in thanking our guests, Tanya Spillavoy, Carla Myers, and Matt DiCarlo uh, for sharing their stories and strategies. And we hope to see you next month when we're going to talk about the glamorous world of printing uh, open textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> and how it sounds super simple, like don't you just press a print button or, you know, hook up some print on demand service, but it actually gets a little thorny. So uh, we'll talk more about that next time. Until then, uh, hashtag small wins. See you there. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, Bye. so much. Thank you.